Welcome back to the Student Hub Live event for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And in this section, we're going to take another look at research, but our topic now is inequality. And I'm joined by Sean Cordell from Philosophy and Victoria Cooper from Criminology to talk about this very broad topic. Now, it's been approached in a variety of ways in many different fields of research. Sean, how do you look at the whole topic of inequality? Okay, when philosophers look at social inequality, that's equality inequality between people. Um, it's usually in a way that's normative. By that I mean it's about what should be the case, not just what is the case. Um, so philosophers will look at particularly what's bad about inequalities. When is inequality bad? Okay. So there are lots of inequalities between people, people at different heights. Uh, I've got a great deal of inequality. There's an inequality between me and great actors or something in their acting abilities. <laughs> but we don't... <laughs> We tend not to think that's a particularly bad thing, that's just how it is. It's not a matter for worrying about why this shouldn't be the case. And when we tend to think that inequality is bad is when we think there's some wrong being done. So it's not just that two people are different, it's that someone's missing out, someone's disadvantaged, someone's got an advantage over someone else, and that's just unfair or it's unjust. And what philosophers argue about is why that's the case, why that's the case, why we uh, value equality, why we should value equality, why we disvalue or don't value inequality, don't value inequality, what's bad about it, and then about what sort of obligations that brings us. Do we have obligations to eradicate inequalities and why? And for political philosophers, and political philosophers talk about, again, what should be the case, it's about how societies or the world should be organised uh, so as to eradicate inequalities and why. So it's, um, if you like, in, at the level of ethics or moral philosophy, it tends to be a focus on the individual, what they should be doing uh, about inequality. Uh, and on a sort of traditional distinction anyway, political philosophers is more about the level of institutions and of entire states and how they should be organised, what they should be doing in terms of getting rid of inequalities. Um, more recently, there's a kind of movement, if you like, in global justice and global ethics, which goes some way to eliding that distinction because the idea that this is about inequalities across the entire world and what everybody has got a responsibility to do to eradicate those. So that's a kind of bit of a thumbnail about what philosophers might say about inequalities. It's not by no means is that exhaustive. It's not everything. That's the kind of questions that get them going. Well, I'd like to come back to that, but before we do, I just wonder, Vicky, if you can tell us broadly what your interest is, because uh, everyone will be wondering here, um, you know, how criminology can sort of link to this idea of inequality. What, what's your take on things? So um, my um, particular research background is in um, housing inequality and homelessness. And those are issues that are fundamentally re related to the problem of social inequality and in my own research I look at the ways in which um, social inequality stems from uneven distribution of wealth. So um, the, and this follows a number of economists and uh, their understanding of um, how social inequality arises. So uneven distribution of wealth is uh, basically, they would argue, an outcome of the way in which wealth is distributed from private, uh, sorry, from public sector institutions to, to private sector institutions. And sometimes governments can facilitate that redistribution of wealth from public sector to private sector through programmes like privatisation, for example, privatisation of previously public sector organisations, public sector services. And um, so in my research, I look at social inequality as stemming from uneven distribution of, of wealth. And this understanding contrasts with the more formal understanding of, um, of wealth and equality. And that's the neoclassical sort of economic understanding. And that idea is that um, 
equality um, or wealth rather can be distributed uh, through a trickle down so from your top income earners wealth can be trickled down to your bottom your poorest income earners and that's kind of the debate that politicians are espousing at the minute if we look at policy programs like austerity that's sort of follows that trickle down um, understanding of distribution of wealth um, but in my research I look at the way in which um, that economic argument in fact generates other problems social problems like housing inequality like homelessness and um, in my research I look at statistics on uh, the difference so social inequality is about the gap between the rich and the poor so one way to understand our current environment of social inequality, it's always good to look at, as a, as, a, as a sort of measure, it's good to look at the differences of wealth between the top 10% and the differences of wealth of, uh, compared to differences in wealth of the bottom 10% income earners. And in the UK at the minute, uh, those uh, people at the top 10% income earners earn 17 times more or have a disposable income that is 17 times greater mm -hmm. than people at the bottom 10% income earners. And so when we look at that, that's like saying if you're a bottom income earner, your disposable income after you pay for your housing rent, etc. you know, imagine you've got £600 a month as disposable income. The person, uh, people at the top 10 income earners will have 17 times more that that's equivalent of 10,000 pound a month in order to to spend as disposable income so that's a significant gap in terms of wealth and poverty um, in terms of uh, the top 10 and the bottom 10 and so my research looks at well what are the problems that stem from that and obviously homelessness and housing inequality is a massive issue currently You've given our audience some questions, and one of them is um, all unequal distributions of wealth and resources are unjust distributions. And 63% of the audience agree with that statement. Um, so, you know, at the heart of what both of you are saying is you're both approaching inequality from the similar sort of perspective. This idea that it's not just a difference, it's this unequal distribution of access to resources. Um, and we can see this sort of very tangible financial um, and therefore um, societal impacts of those issues. But Sean, you're looking from a very sort of moral and theoretical perspective at some of these. And so what I want to know from, from you really is, is why these debates are so important to have. And, and if Vicky's going around looking at sort of the impact of not having as much money on disposable income, how does philosophy sort of take a spin on this? And, and how useful then is that contribution? Right, well, uh, that, that was a really good could, could you get that up again? Or yeah, is that possible? The widget, the widget question. Widget. It's 63% of people who agreed with the statement all unequal distributions of wealth and right. resources are unjust. Well, I mean, if we think about, I mean, the, strictly speaking, that means that they think that any inequality, so anyone that's got a, a bit more than somebody else, that's an injustice. Mm. Um, they might think that, but they, actually, if you think about it, it might, that might, it might be that you think, well, it's actually all right for somebody to have a little bit more. You know, somebody, for example, might want to, um, theoretically, I'm, I just want to work more hours. I'll work six, <laughs> six, I don't. Yeah, I'll just work more, I'll have two jobs and I'll have a bit more new that has one job or whatever. And, you know, is that, in, is that unjust? And now we get to one of the questions that philosophers argue about, and this is what I've been looking at recently, not least in preparation for this session. But, <laughs> uh, and we get to, the question of equality of what, or what kind of inequality do we try and eradicate? And one big sort of school of egalitarianism, now egalitarianism, as its name suggests, name on the tin, uh, is a theory of equality. You know, uh, you know your French. And um, one dominant approach here is, that, uh, is to say that what should be eradicated is the uh, inequalities that arise from bad luck meaning, look, if it's not your fault, if you were born into a situation of inequality, you, you're not responsible for that. So what, what is just, what a, what a just society should do is eradicate those equalities. Try and, try and arrange things so you're not subject to this sort of bad luck. However, if, what, if, you, I don't know, if you earn a bit more money or a lot more money because you just uh, have made good choices and you've worked hard or whatever, or you decide that, well, I'm not too bothered about having a lot of money, I'm, 
I, you know, take it easy. Those sort of inequalities on this view, then, I mean, that, that's kind of, as it were, up to you. And that's, that's, not, that's not an injustice. That's, a, that's an acceptable uh, inequality. And it's not one that we need to worry about. So on this view, there they wouldn't be that all distributions of certainly wealth are unjust, only some. Only those that are subject, or the only ones we should redress, are the ones that arise from bad luck, some sorts of bad luck. Well, we asked our audience whether inequalities are justifiable only if they benefit the least well off. What right. do you think people would have said? I don't know, but before we get on. <laughs> before we get, just, just, if you haven't voted, do so now. But I, need, I, need, I need to look. No. Okay, we can't do, but th I mean, th that view, it needs to be said, it, it is one that was, um, a, a, it's, not, it's not something I invented. I can't take the credit. <laughs> there was a, a man called John Rawls who in 1971 wrote a book called The Theory of Justice. Why are we still banging on about that? Because ever since it's been the kind of, it's been the wellspring of all this, a lot of this debate about, of, of well, a theory of justice, about, uh, about inequality and so on. And he, Rawls is, it's disputed, but Rawls is credited as being one of the sort of first of these luck egalitarians who thought we should, uh, we should eradicate the effects of the inequalities arising from bad luck. And one of the principles he kind of ca came to it's a big book, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing things down here, was exactly that. If you just say that again, I mean, that was one of the principles, or part of one of the principles at which he arrived, which, that, which was to say that inequalities are permissible, but only when they benefit the least well off. So in other words, you know, it, we, we can have inequality only when it means the ones here are going up as well. So what we can't do is that. We can do that, and that's acceptable. And actually, I think feeding into at least some, some versions of sort of trickle down, at, Rawls, was, Rawls didn't propose that, but I think some versions of trying to appeal to that kind of, yeah. look, you know, yeah, okay, some people get very rich, but actually uh, the ones that the poorest get, yeah. get richer too. So yeah. everyone's happy. And I think there are, in, in fact, there are severe problems with that. Yeah. that yeah, well, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea that um, the, the trickle-down effect uh, works is, is problematic. I mean, an example is uh, that, for example, uh, corporations uh, like Amazon and Uber, mm -hmm. um, that people benefit from those uh, large corporations because they generate employment where there's high unemployment. And that might be the case, but there's also problems with the conditions of employment um, and there's also problems with, for example, zero hours contracts and a lot of those employment contracts are on zero hours contracts and people who are on zero hours contracts earn 50% less than those people who are on permanent employment contracts. So there's, so there's all kinds of issues with the trickle down effect um, and, and currently, you know, in our austerity um, uh, in our austerity political environment at the minute, um, it's based on this idea of fiscal discipline and, and that is that um, we take money out of public expenditure but we um, lower corporate taxes, we lower taxes for the wealth in order to attract business investment and that's because, that's because austerity is premised on this idea that if we attract business investment then we can generate economic growth that way and we can generate a distribution of wealth that way. So fiscal discipline is, is, is kind of modelled on that trickle-down effect. Um, but as I've argued in my research, especially on housing inequality and evictions, what we're seeing is all kinds of social problems around evictions, um, around household debt, um, around homelessness. We've seen a 134% increase in rough sleeping since austerity came into effect, since key cuts were made in public expenditure. So absolutely, yeah, there's, there are problems when the gap between the rich and the poor is, is wide, is, is large. Um, there's, it creates all kinds of issues um, at, the, at the bottom end. Would you like the answer to what people said at home now? I would. Okay. Well, it's gone up. Um, inequalities are justifiable only if they benefit the least well off. Let's see what you have to say at home. So 60% agree. 40% disagree. That's been moving up as we've been talking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 40% think that that's not the case, so that it could be that they're justifiable if they don't. Have I got that right? <laughs> I'm thinking it through. <laughs> I'll be careful now. Yeah, I wouldn't, but, I wouldn't do that. So inequalities are justifiable if the, only if they benefit the least well off. Mm -hmm. So if they benefit the least well off, then we can justify them. If they don't benefit the least well off, we can't justify them. Mm -hmm. Right. 
uh, and forty percent disagree with that. Yeah. Okay. I, that's, I thought it was quite surprising. I thought the the, the difference principle, as well called it, would be more popular than that with with the viewers. But I'm uh, I don't know. So, if and are inequalities ever justified? Well, you see that that's good because I mean. The, of the 40% that disagree with that, I don't know. I'm not second guessing what the. It's a multiple choice question, so you can't get any more information. This is the problem with your method. <laughs> it's not my method, it's your method. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you just want simplicity. But that's good because, okay, so one, one view is that, I mean, this one view which is not, well, not obviously egalitarian, is that justice is a matter of entitlement. And actually, uh, this isn't my view. But arrival to roles I mentioned in, uh, shortly after. I mean, I'm not talking about sort of old men from years ago, but this is this is the, 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 the theories that very roughly might correspond to a lot of what's informing the you know, rationales behind economics now, and what we might call libertarian economics. Well, uh, philosophically behind that, to a large extent, was a, a guy called Robert Nozick, um, and his conception of like what was just was, well, if, if you got it in the first place by just what you call just acquisition, if there was no injustice involved in, in, in getting hold of something, say you inherited it, and it happens to be that you're stinking rich, that's not unjust. Okay, it's not, it's not equal. You know, you're gonna have a great deal more than somebody else. And, you know, this, that, that's what matters. Is it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was it just in the first place? Uh, and if, if somebody, so it wouldn't be just that you went and took it or stole it. But if, it, if you got it by uh, even inheritance, you know, it's not that, it's, uh, that that's okay, even if you're uh, royal or something like that, if it's, it, it doesn't, that inequality isn't, isn't an unjust one. Whether or not it actually has any effect on the lowest, uh, on the, um, the bottom of the pile, as it were, to put it. So there's no badly. real problem with the inequality at the top end. It's the bottom end that you're both more worried about. Well, Okay, yeah, I mean, but then, but then it might be that, I mean, it could be that, so the 40% the there who disagreed with that could still be, could still say that there's a certain level at which people, everyone is entitled to, you know, a, a level of subsistence, existence, or welfare, or resources that everyone should have, so you have a baseline. It's just that they, so you can hold that view and say that uh, everyone have, should have sufficient, there's an entitlement there. But above that, it's, you know, you, it, what, it, it, it what you get is what you get if you want to, you know, w whether by luck or by um, hard work or anything else or good fortune or inheritance, it could be that the rest is fair game sort of thing. But you could actually say that, but that's not really a theory of equality. That's just a theory that uh, people are in of certain entitlements. I mean, one way of backing that up and one way of backing up many theories of um, egalitarian theories as well, what feeding into it is this, is that what matters is equal moral status, so this, this is that everybody is afforded respect as a moral person, as, as somebody who has a conception of their, their good and has, can, can reason morally, is, it should be afforded the same respect. Uh, and in that, in, in that way, you, you could say they should have at least have, shouldn't be denied equality of opportunity. They should all have access to the, you know, uh, fair access to uh, positions in society or whatever, um, is another way of looking at it. I'm really interested in what the 40% think, but we, as you say, we can't go, we, put the different views there. And, and the 60% as well, why, why they think that, but anyway. Yeah. So we've just got a nice pink widget with the, which is gonna show up for people at home saying, do you agree or disagree? So Sean, while I talk to Vicky, you can think of a question oh. that sort of links from that so oh. that we can get some sense of agreeing and disagreeing. So what we're talking about here really is this, this idea of inequality and there being some sort of threshold which becomes problematic, okay, with access to something. Mm -hmm. so, so Vicky, I mean, you're clearly looking at the sort of lower end of the spectrum. By lower, mm -hmm. I mean less access to things and, mm -hmm. and clearly having a massive impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that sort of parameter or distinction as being important to sort of start researching things? Is it the homelessness or is it other aspects associated with the homelessness? How, how are you approaching this? Well, I'm looking at currently my research and my research, I'm looking at the ways in which um, 
policies that have resulted from reductions in expenditure to uh, key welfare services um, such as housing, um, such as um, other services that would help people who are struggling with housing. Um, so I'm looking at how those policies which have resulted in a reduction in spending in those areas have actually increased um, housing inequality. But also, as, as well as looking at the, the fallout of those people at the bottom 10%, mm. as well as looking at homelessness and, and evictions, uh, I'm also interested in the way in which housing wealth is created too. Mm. So private rented sector, for example, um, is, uh, has increased. Uh, rents in the private rented sector has increased. We've seen in Scotland, for example, we've seen a rise uh, in rents of 16%. That's the national, that's the national average in Scotland, but in some places like Glasgow and Edinburgh, the private rents have increased by 30 to 40%. So the individual renter has to spend more money on their rent and someone is profiting mm -hmm. <laughs> from that expenditure, from that increase in rent. Mm -hmm. So it's um, currently we're in a housing economy where there are where there are no regulations. There's no regulation on, on there's no rent control um, to to protect individuals within private renting. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at as well as you know the fallout of our current um, situation of social inequality, I'm also interested in how it's also generating forms of housing wealth too. Mm. Um, certainly within, uh, if we look at the policies that came out under austerity like bedroom tax, uh, benefit cap, universal credit, they've also been um, policies which have been about reductions in housing benefit actually, as well as um, affecting other aspects of people's life. And when you um, cut back in housing benefit, you're effectively cutting back on housing rent, on a person's ability to spend money and, and to be able to afford their rent at a time when rents are increasing. So we've got you know, a really complicated situation at the minute for people at the bottom 10%, um, where at uh, the peak in 2015, we saw 115 evictions per day. And that's obviously a key issue affecting homeless people. We've seen a 60% rise in uh, the bottom 10% going into temporary accommodation. And um, you know, we've seen, as I said, we've seen 134% rise in, in, in rough sleeping, and those are just the figures we know about, mm -hmm. right? These are just the figures we know about. So, a number of charities would argue that that's massively underestimated too. So, as well as look at the bottom end, I'm also interested in the top end and how there's a, a generation of wealth um, created out of out of, of of this aspect of poverty. Mm. Oops. Okay, brilliant. Have you thought of a question, Sean? You're looking very yeah. pensive. You don't have to have one, because I've got something else I want to ask you. <laughs> I've always looked pensive. It's my job. Um, but what did you, did you want to tell me what you wanted to ask me, and then I'll, just, I'll tell you my question if it's... If I think it's or do you want the question? I want the, the question. The question has to be yes or no, is that right? Yes, yeah? do you agree or disagree? That's what I was pensive about. OK, so why? What, try, try um, equal rights are more important than equal wealth. Try that. Equal rights yeah. are more important yeah. than equal wealth. Okay, so if you convert on that, equal rights are more important than equal wealth. Do you agree or disagree? Okay, so now this is the hard question, Sean, because... That wasn't hard. Right, okay. No, 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 <laughs> that's a hard question. <laughs> but you don't have to answer that one. <laughs> Everyone at home does. What I want to know is if you're posing these sort of debates and these theoretical problems, um, and you're looking at to what extent inequalities are ever justified. Mm. What is the point of it? I mean, what are you doing? Um, how, how does what you're doing make a difference to the world? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting theoretically, I sort of get that. But I'd really like to know sort of what you're doing in terms of when you're finding this stuff out, isn't there a sort of social ethical obligation to do something? Right. Yeah, I have, that's a good question. Two, two things. I mean, one is the theoretical work is behind just about every kind of system of government or, or, or um, you know, political doctrine that's enacted ever. I mean, there's always a philosophy behind it. Doesn't it? So, it does, I mean, it, it does, perhaps unlike other theoretical areas, it, it does actually, it's pretty clearly does uh, ideology or it does drive uh, policies and practice and the way things are. So, I mean, that that's one answer. It just, it, you just can't, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't see how you can't get into this stuff if you ever want to justify, if governments want to justify what they do, and uh, all right, they've come out of a lot of 
blah, blah, blah. But actually, if you want to get down to the real justification, this is going to have to be some kind of philosophical discourse behind it. That's one answer. The other one's quite interesting. I mean, it, 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 your, your question was about if you're thinking about these things, does it tell you about what to do? And some some people have said, coming back to this, the thought about um, the global justice or global ethics, for example, some people, notably some um, uh, Peter Singer, who's a sort of contemporary, quite well-known utilitarian philosopher, who some time ago made the point uh, that if you uh, if you've an obligation to save someone who's in front of you, like a child who's drowning or whatever, if you've got an obligation to do that, and we think, oh yes, we have, then you've got an obligation to help a child that's starving thousands of miles away. And he actually, I mean, this is actually directly, he was, it, this was quite, in quite a challenging piece of work to say, you've got no excuse, as it were, not to help starving people uh, across the world. And that means giving to charity, which he does, like giving all but what he needs to, to, to get by. To charity, so you know, actually, if you, there is a, a question of um, thinking this through and, and and posing a challenge to yourself, or as another another some, another scholar in this field, Jerry Cohen said, if uh, wrote a book called "If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich?" It was a direct challenge to say, look, and to himself, he was a professor, he earned good money. Uh, you know, what's going on? I, I do, I've got all these lovely ideas about equality and what, how the world should be, and I I'm, I'm comfortably off. Uh, and and that was what this book was about. So I think at the level of government and society and at the level of individuals, thinking these things through really does have an effect. I don't think it, I don't think it can't. No. But that's why I don't think about some of these guys because they're so complicated. Yes. And, and because then, as you say, you know, when you do pose those questions, they, they do then warrant that sort of response or at least consideration. Yeah. Or you, or you need to justify, I mean, you know, you. You, if you're really going to think hard about this, you have to think about uh, your own situation and whether or not it's justified and what you might do about it. And of course, that's not, it's, not, it's not just that you get there and then beat yourself over the head with guilt. People have responses and say, well, you know, actually, well, various responses like, well, actually, yes, we should do everything we can to ensure at least a minimal level of well, welfare for everyone or, or whatever, or uh, whatever line you take. But it does prompt those sort of that's kind of self-examination. It's not just, it's not just abstract theorizing, right? Or it's not. Oh, that's not. That that may, that's not where it ends. Mm. Might not. Might start there. No. And if if people are interested, then uh, there's a block on uh, A222 exploring philosophy about this, isn't there? Uh, y yes, indeed. On uh, block six and a large section that is about egalitarianism and uh, and justice as well. Um, we're also doing a, a MOOC, massive online open course. Yeah, get that right. Which is on global global ethics and global justice. So that's that's in the pipeline. So watch this space or a space. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Let's see the results for your question and see what people at home had to say. Ninety percent agree. Right. That's interesting. And what are you going to say for our concluding thoughts then, Sean? Uh, is that my job? Yes, I don't is. want to dominate this. Uh, I I I don't. Again, I can't say why people thought that. But what one view. The appealing view is that if you uh, equality of rights can it, it can at least maximise the possibility of um, equality of rights and equality of entitlements to take opportunities can, on one view, lead uh, it's most likely to lead lead to an, an an equal outcome, an equal situation, a fair distribution of resources, and that might be why people think that the rights uh, are prior. They're the, they're the sort of they come first, as it were. Yeah. They might not. Um. And if more people had this approach, Vicky, would that solve then some of the problems of the distribution? Well, currently, I mean, th this is the problem that we're facing at the minute is because those basic entitlements have been removed and those basic entitlements that predict that protected previously the most vulnerable. We've seen a complete withdrawal of um, legal aid and as a result of cuts to legal aid, we've seen a um, resultant effect of that is 500,000 fewer civil cases. So we're seeing a lack of access to justice, in fact, um, as a result of these uh, cuts to people's basic entitlements. So at a time when people need access to justice most in our current political environment, they don't have the access to justice because their basic entitlement has been removed. 
So absolutely, it would work if uh, ideally if we had a, a a set basic level. But if that's not if that's not defined anywhere in law, um, and if that's not protected through the decades in law and politically, then absolutely, th 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 then we have issues that we're currently facing now. So there's a link there between legal justice and distributive justice. So just so I was mainly talking about distributive justice, the justice of who gets what, as it were, and that's a link there to, I mean, actual legal justice. Yeah, it's not absolutely. being, it's not being. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's been a fascinating conversation, which unfortunately we need to leave there, but you've certainly given us a lot to ponder, and it's been a really, really interesting, um, very different take on both of your research. So thank you so much, Vicky and Sean. Um, we're now going to show a couple of videos. Um, firstly, we're going to um, see a video um, from Sarah Crafter, which is about um, uh, between protection and exclusion. So this is about child, uh, separated child migrants care relationships and caring practices. And then we have um, a short video from Sean Williams, who will be a guest in our next session, um, which is about uh, some of the technical stuff that we do in A232. Um, so enjoy those videos and join me for the next session, which is about technology in a few minutes.